Good evening everyone. I declare the meeting open at three minutes past six. And we start by acknowledging that tonight we meet on the lands of the Wadjuk people of the Noongar Nation and pay our respects to Elders past, present and emerging. Um, I see that we are all here, so there's no apologies this evening, which is great to see. Um, so I'll take us straight to public question time. Um, members of the public gallery, I welcome you to tonight's council meeting. This is your opportunity to um, speak on items on the agenda tonight. There is no set order, it's just whoever would like to make their way to the microphone first. Um, we do ask that you state your name, your address and the item to which you're speaking. And just for, um, just for your information, we do have two deputations tonight and they actually follow after public question time. So if you're here to do a deputation, we're not quite there yet and we'll let you know when that will take place. Thank you. Fourth of July to sixth of July due to personal commitments. Can I have a mover and seconder, please? Moved Councillor Toppelberg, seconded Councillor Loden. All those in favour? Declare it carried. Thank you. The second leave of absence is from Councillor Toppelberg um, from the twenty first of September two thousand eighteen to the second of October two thousand eighteen due to work commitments. Can I please have a mover and seconder? Move Councillor Loden, seconded Councillor Castle. All those in favour? Declare it carried. Thank you. And the third council members is from Councillor Ros Harley, seeking leave of absence from the 5th to the 12th of July inclusive. Can I please have a mover and seconder? Moved Councillor Castle, seconded Councillor Hallett. All those in favour? Declare it carried. Thank you. Okay, we're now on to item five, the receiving of petitions, deputations and presentations. We do have two petitions to receive tonight, so I'll just go to the CEO to read those out. Thank you, Mayor Cole. The first petition we've received is from Mr A. Jamieson of Car Street, West Perth, along with 16 signatures, requesting that Council considers excluding the properties on the northern side of Car Street between numbers 68 and 82 from inclusion in the recent proposal submitted to review the Cleaver Precinct under the Character Retention and Heritage Areas Policy. Um, just as uh, by way of elaboration, Council Members, that relates to uh, the items, uh, the community budget submission items that are referenced in agenda papers, so agenda item 13.4. Um, in dealing with uh, both petitions this evening, Clause 2.24 of Council's Meeting Procedures Local Law outlines the options that are available to Council. Um, in the case of this, uh, I'll read out all of those options for you, Council Members. Yes, so the, the options are available are uh, firstly that the petition be received, secondly the petition be received and a report be prepared. Thirdly, petition be received and referred to a committee for consideration. And lastly, that the petition be received and be dealt with by the council. So they are council's options. Councillors, given that, that ref that's relevant to item 13.4, um, I'd propose that we go with the last option, is that the petition is received and dealt with by council, that being tonight when we get to item 13.4, unless there's any alternative views to be put forward. Okay, I'll put it, all those are... Uh, Mover and seconder, yes. Moved Councillor Murphy, seconded Councillor Harley. All those in favour? Declare it carried. Uh, thank you, Mayor Cole. The second petition we've received is from Mr A. Stryker of Burke Street, Leadville, along with 22 signatures in relation to the proposed development at number 12 Scott Street, Leadville, requesting that Council 1. Apply the City's deemed to comply compliance setback of 7.9 metres for both house and garage, and 2. Circulate the revised plans to community consultation with no approval or a conditional approval. And um, further to the Mayor's advice just then, Council Members, that item relates to uh, number uh, agenda item 9.1 on tonight's agenda. So, councillors, again, I think that if we refer this for council to deal with um, tonight when we're dealing with item 9.1, so I put that we um, receive the petition and deal with it in that way. Can I have a mover and seconder, please? Move Councillor Murphy, seconded Councillor Fatakis. All those in favour? I declare it carried. Thank you. Um, we now have two deputations this evening, and they are both in relation to item uh, 9.4, which is number 33A Redfern Street, North Perth, grouped dwelling. So just um, 
In relation to a deputation, this is a um, opportunity for people who request that wish to speak longer than the three minutes that are allowed during public question time. Um, and it is something that I'm always willing to grant where um, members of the community or applicants wish to have additional time. Um, but in doing so, I do ask that you respect that Council has received a lot of communication on this item. Um, we have had numerous emails and correspondence from both parties. So please take that what has already been provided to council members as read and forming part of our considerations this evening. And I also do ask that um, in terms of dealing with the matter that we do stick to the planning matters before us and that we are respectful to each other and council um, at all times. Can I have the first speaker, please? of the meeting, council meeting of the 29th of May 2018. Can I please have a mover and seconder to adopt the minutes? Move Councillor Loden, seconded Councillor Murphy. All those in favour? I declare the minutes carried. Um, we are now moving to our announcements by the presiding member. So that's me. And we do have a very exciting and quite um, large agenda this evening. It must be because it's the financial year end um, and a lot of projects are coming and policies are coming to fruition at this point after a busy year of work. So just a couple of things I wanted to highlight on the agenda tonight is that we do have before us the approval of the concept design for North Perth Town Common which is the City of Vincent's flagship open space project for this coming financial year which will be constructed within next um, financial year. It's an iconic design, it's big and bold and something different for North Perth and for the City of Vincent and it has been two years in the making and it has involved extensive um, consultation to get to this point so we're excited about that. Um, we also have some significant strategies and plans that will have great benefit for our environment on the agenda tonight and that is the greening plan and our um, waste strategy, both which will be going out for consultation. And of course we have the adoption of the 2018-19 budget um, within this, fin this financial year. Well done, Director of Corporate Services. Um, first for us in a while. And um, as well as our corporate business plan and our community budget submissions. So um, yeah, quite a lot of work has gone into these items tonight. In addition to the items on tonight's agenda, I did just also want to mention that the City of Vincent is proposing a 40 kilometre an hour um, speed zone trial in Vincent's southern suburbs on residential roads. You might have seen this um, in the media recently. It's something that does get people talking. You have uh, those that are gung-ho and those not so keen. But in our City of Vincent area, we believe that our residents are asking for slower speeds on the streets and it's all about bringing back that neighbourhood feel and allowing people to get out onto the street, to ride, to walk, to play and to spend time and uh, not just have our streets used for rat running and, and as um, thoroughfares. So this is something that we're pretty excited to take out to the community and again we'll be doing that um, through consultation. Uh, also just to mention um, we like to bring out the awards at council meetings. For those at home this is the latest award. Um, from uh, this was presented to, uh, I believe Jimmy Murphy was in attendance, Councillor Jimmy Murphy and our Acting Director of uh, Community Engagement, Ros Ellis, to receive this award from Parks and Leisure for Stratty, Lady Streets Open, where we closed um, Leaderville Town Centre to cars and made it open to people. And we had some fantastic activations um, in partnership through Leaderville Connect, who brought Fringe to uh, to um, Leaderville in February and we had some other exciting things happen there like Boxville, the cardboard box city and um, it was a really great initiative and we're really keen to continue that next um, year and we have money on budget to do so. Um, also just to mention that the Mount Hawthorne Hub AGM is happening this Wednesday tomorrow night at the Art Garage in Mount Hawthorne so for anyone who's interested in getting involved in a cracking town team please do make it along if you're in Mount Hawthorne and to mention that we also have NAIDOC week celebrations coming up with the theme being because of her we can so we are paying tribute and celebrating um, lots of uh, wonderful Noongar women um, including Gina Williams who will be attending our Noongar, um, our NAIDOC week celebrations at Hyde Park on Monday the 9th of July and finally just to let you know, all know that we are consulting on our new um, 
our new policies in relation to verges and street trees and what you can do there, making sure that people have a lot more freedom to have their swings, their veggie gardens, their rocks, their stones, their seats, their little libraries, and uh, we want to stand out of the way and let that happen without having to go through painful approval processes. So if that's of interest, please do hop on and um, provide your feedback through that consultation process. Okay. And next we have declarations of interest. So, CEO, please um, fill us in. Thank you, Mayor Cole. The first I've received is a disclosure of impartiality interest from Councillor Joe Fatakis on item 18.1. Um, expressions of interest received for disposition of 245 Vincent Street. The extent of Councillor Fatakis's interest is that she completed work for the managing agent Realmark Proprietary Limited in 2016, ending in December 2016. The company also displayed a sign during Councillor Fatakis's election campaign during September and October 2017. As a consequence, there may be a perception that Councillor Fatakis's impartiality on the matter could be affected. Councillor Fatakis has declared that she will consider the matter on its merits and vote accordingly. The second disclosure I've received is from Councillor Jimmy Murphy in relation to items 9.3 and 9.6. The extent of Councillor Murphy's interest in, that matter, in those matters is that he sits on the Tamala Park Regional Council with Bianca Sandry, who also works for uh, Urbanista, the planning consultants for both of those applications, and she currently also volunteers with the town team movement, uh, of which Councillor Murphy is the convener. As a consequence, there may be a perception that Councillor Murphy's interest on the matter could be affected. Councillor Murphy has declared that he will consider the matter on its merits and vote accordingly. The second disclosure I have received is also an impartiality interest disclosure. It's from Councillor Josh Tobelberg on item 9.2, Orange Ave, Perth. The, extents of, the extent of Councillor Tobelberg's interest in this matter is that he has a professional relationship with one of the adjoining neighbours and has briefly discussed the proposal in terms of the planning framework and the impact on the neighbourhood. As a consequence, there may be a perception that Councillor Tobelberg's impartiality on the matter could be affected. Councillor Toppelberg declares that he will consider the matter on its merits and vote accordingly. And lastly, a impartiality interest disclosure from Mayor Emma Cole on item 9.3, Woodville Street, North Perth. Mayor Cole has disclosed that Mr Neil Roberts, who has taken on a lead role on behalf of neighbouring residents in liaising with the applicant, uh, also works with Mayor Cole's husband. As a consequence, there may be a perception that Mayor Cole's impartiality on the matter could be affected. Mayor Emma Cole has declared that she will consider the matter on its merits and vote accordingly. Thank you, CEO. Um, I will now go to the councillors to see if there are any items in addition to those already raised in the public gallery and that are not um, absolute majority requiring an absolute majority decision. If there are any further items that you wish to raise for debate this evening, please do let me know. I'll start with you, Councillor Hallett. Councillor Castle, Councillor Harley, Councillor Murphy, Councillor Loden. Just 10.1. Councillor Fatakis, Councillor Toppelberg. Thank you. Uh, 9.2 and 9.8. Thank you. <coughs> Councillor Gonshevsky. CEO, we also need um, the 10.2 Greening Vincent Garden Awards so we can choose council members to be the judges. Um, Mayor, may I seek guidance on um, 18.1? Whether, given that there's a <coughs> conflict of interest that's been um, tabled whether that's going to now be raised as part of the, or is it going to go that through on block? That will be dealt with separately, it won't you. be moved on block. Yeah, um, through you, Mayor Cole, and additionally, because the disclosure of interest was impartiality only, it was neither proximity nor financial, and as a consequence, um, even if that were a public item, there would be no need for it to be dealt with separately. So just to clarify, it's not going to go through on block? Through you, Mayor Cole, that's correct. It'll be a confidential item that'll have to be discussed separately by okay. Council. Um, 
Are you just clarifying which just, item would you like to clarify? Oh, just um, I'm not sure. Thirteen point two, the MRC nomination as well. That's an absolute majority decision. So yes, that will be brought out. Okay, so. I'll now go to the CEO to outline which items will be moved on block this evening. Thank you, Mayor Cole. Um, members of the public gallery, as well as anyone viewing uh, via live stream on the internet, I'll now just read through the agenda items that Council will adopt on block in accordance with the officer recommendations that are presented in the agenda papers. These on block items that are to be adopted by Council exclude. Sorry. Yeah, that's right. Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, apologies. Um, the items that Council will be considering on block exclude all of the items that a public question or statement or deputation has related to, as well as exclude the items that Council members have expressly requested be dealt with separately, as well as the four absolute majority items that are listed in the agenda papers. As a consequence, the following items that I'll read out in order are the ones that Council will adopt on block as per the officer recommendations. They are 10.3, uh, 11 11.1, 11.2, 11.3, 11.4, 11.5, 12 11.1, 13.1, 13.5, noting, Mayor Cole, that all of the development services items will be individually considered by Council. Thank you, CEO. Can I please have a mover and seconder for the on block items? Move Councillor Murphy, seconded Councillor Loden. All those in favour? I declare the on block items carried. Um, so, just for people in the public gallery and for people who might be web streaming tonight, the way that we move through the items from this point is that we go to the items that were raised by members of the public gallery first and in the order that they were raised. So, there will be a bit of jumping around in the agenda at first. Um, the first item that was raised this evening was item 9.6, which was number 48, Milton Street, Mount Hawthorne, proposed five, um, proposed five group dwellings. Do I have a mover and seconder for this item, please? Moved Councillor Loden, seconded Councillor Toppelberg. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I can fully appreciate the applicant's uh, um, views around this development um, and uh, the, the aspects around the de departures from the, built, the deemed to comply provisions. Um, but when I look at this development as a whole, um, I, I support the officer recommendation for refusal. When you look at the general area, you can see that there, in general most of those places have been redeveloped as part of the densification of the city, and that is entirely appropriate in that area. You can see very clearly that the bulk of those sites have been developed as three developments. This is five developments, and it's squeezing a bit too much onto um, this area. I think the applicant needs to go back and have a look at that uh, and consider those uh, more fully. You might be able to fit four on there, but three clearly is what other, other people have done in that site, and that's probably a good thing to look to for the future. Councillor Toppelberg, any further comments in relation to this item? But what we have before us is a recommendation for refusal. Further comments? Um, look, I'll just comment that um, I understand um, that this is something that the applicant believes is, is should be approved this evening. <coughs> Um, and I would like to compliment them on uh, meeting the, de the deep soil zone and the canopy. But in relation to other aspects of the design, I feel that there's been a heavy reliance on what is currently in situ in this area of Mount Hawthorne. And it has been something that I have been at pains to, to express to the applicant that many of the developments um, along in this area were developed, were, were approved prior to our built form policy and that we are really um, at great going to great lengths to achieve better outcomes in this area and that to rely on what is the um, presents as the existing streetscape is not a sufficient argument for the um, approval of this development. Um, I had hoped that between, uh, between the time that this was deferred at the last meeting and the design that was before us tonight that there would be more significant well, that there would be more significant changes made to the development application. I note that there was some uh, minimal changes around articulation with some 
really just being material finishes only, um, and that the actual uh, footprint and number of dwellings and the issues raised for refusal in the officer recommendation, in my view, haven't really been fully dealt with. So um, there hasn't been a sufficient um, measure in place to really address those concerns raised, and um, I don't feel that this is capable of being approved in its current form, so I'll be supporting the officer recommendation. Are there any further comments? Okay, I'll put it. All those in favour? Declare it carried. Thank you. Next item on the agenda is 13.4, which is Community Budget Submissions 2018-19. Do I have a mover and seconder, please? Move Councillor Gonczeszewski, seconded Councillor Toppelberg. Thank you, Mayor. Um, look, just this year we've asked our community to help us build our budget again through the community budget submission process and we have before us a recommendation to support 12 of 24 submissions received to a value of more than 320000 in 2018-2019 uh, year. We've got proposals that will improve our parks, <coughs> um, provide more sporting facilities, improve um, disability access and um, and as we heard from the gallery, provide a uh, new uh, focal point for the dog lovers and community at Jack Marks Reserve. Uh, we've also got ongoing support for the program services and events um, at YMCA HQ and Loftus Community Centre. Um, I think it's also important to note that um, where proposals have not been supported or have consideration has been deferred, that um, the good ideas are not lost. Um, that some submissions that may not have necessarily aligned with this process have been flagged for consideration under fun other funding streams and, um, and certainly um, we've seen strong analysis and consideration of the proposals put forward from administration. I'm so happy to support this recommendation going forward. Uh, just a comment in relation to um, the furniture or the, the, the request and then the um, allocation of funding in the commentary around furnishings for Jack Marks Reserve and just that uh, I hope that uh, obviously between the keen interest there is in the community and uh, the capability that we have that we don't end up with standard park furniture there but that we also don't over design to the point that we end up with a singular three seater uh, bench for the number of people that need it. It is always a challenge but um, yeah I'd also uh, will be keen to follow up to see where we have potentially had uh, um, uh, cash in lieu provided for uh, potentially even for art projects. Uh, I'm mindful of the number of dwellings that have been approved uh, in the DA on Wright Street and I'm not sure whether that had a percent for art component uh, attached to it. I'll um, check that out later but I think that there may be potential to incorporate uh, some design elements to get something other than uh, a number of park benches in there. So uh, support the proposal. I will also comment briefly about the um, the numerous requests in relation to the uh, uh, Cleaver Precinct and the uh, idea of it being a heritage area uh, and I will just say that from my personal uh, point of view the community budget submission process is not the place to be making that request. It's a very specific planning request. I think that the budget allocation that's been alluded to uh, in terms of the work the city is looking to do generally uh, in terms of our our efforts in relation to character retention uh, don't directly relate to it and I uh, appreciate the uh, both the uh, the uh, the interest and the passion of the community uh, on both sides of and, and I, you know, ultimately that question will be answered I assume in the next uh, one to two years as we proceed down the path with uh, with this body of work but uh, I uh, yeah I, I just I did want to make that that general comment that it, it, the, the community budget submission process is not uh, generally seen as an avenue to request our planning uh, officers to focus their attention in a particular area of work. Councillors, any further comments? Um, look, I'll just briefly say that it's great to see the community budget submission process has been embedded in our project in our budget process and this is the third year that we've done this and it doesn't doesn't look to be anything that we'll be doing away with. It's something I think that our community really engages with and we do get some really fantastic ideas through. So really pleased to see this continue as part of our um, annual budget process. I'll put it. All those in favour? Declare it carried. Thank you. Next item is 9.3, 42 Woodville Street, North Perth, proposed six dwellings. 
Um, do I have a mover for this item, please? A mover, please, for 42 Woodville Street. Thank you, Councillor Loden. A seconder, please, Councillor Gondoshevsky. Thank you, Mayor. Um, this is a challenging one. It's clearly a very contentious one in the community with a large number of people uh, being opposed to this development. Um, the particular thing that I see is around the concern... Sorry, I'm getting my, my items confused here. Um, <laughs> let me restart. Um, the primary concern I see with this development is the wall height, which is uh, 6.4 metres versus a deemed to comply of 6 metres. And the question for us uh, as Council is whether or not we feel that meets the deemed to comply, oh, sorry, the, the principles of uh, the built form policy. Um, and whilst I can respect the, uh, um, the neighbours' concerns around that wall height, it is a matter of 40 centimetres. Um, and I, I believe that that, is, that does meet the design principles and as such I'm happy to support the officer recommendation. Councillor Gondoshevsky. I just wanted to um, uh, ask a question in relation to um, the, yes, the, the boundary wall uh, in relation to what was raised by um, Ms McCabe in the gallery. Um, in relation to the boundary wall that comes uh, uh, it could be in alignment with um, uh, openings on the uh, neighbouring property. And also um, just some clarification on what the um, boundary fence will look like on the neighbour's sides. Is it possible to get just some advice from the director, Acting Director of Development Services in relation to those two issues that were raised? Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, uh, elevation on the submitted plans uh, shows <laughs> in fact that the elevation uh, the, the storeroom will be a, a boundary wall um, with the fencing either side of that being normal dividing fences uh, I note the concern raised by the neighbour in terms of the, the dogs etc um, there is uh, legislation that deals with uh, dividing fences um, and in terms of what permissions are required to enable fences to be changed or modified or replaced. Um, there is a, a fair bit of literature from the State Government about that issue and that can be provided to the, the neighbour if that assists. But ultimately the, um, the recommendation of approval is accompanied by a condition number one, which relates to boundary walls and ensuring the owners of the subject land uh, finish and maintain it uh, in good and clean condition prior to the occupation of the use of the development. Um, staff would expect that the developer lia will be liaising with affected landowners regarding the construction of that wall to determine the finish on the neighbour's side of that wall. Thank you. Um, look, I'm supportive of this um, recommend the officer recommendation. Um, I note that there's conditions in relation to the truncation parking management plan and signage and bicycle parking, um, and um, so I think that with those in place, that will act to ameliorate some of the impact of the development. Um, councillors, just noting also there is an amendment on the table. Councillor Loden. I'm happy to move the amendment. Do I have a seconder for the amendment on the lemon? Councillor Vitakis, thank you. I think this additional condition 11 helps to uh, moderate the, the privacy concerns that have been raised as well. Um, yeah. And just for the benefit of the public gallery, this is condition 11, screening the approved plans that have been modified to the city's satisfaction to provide that the proposed privacy screens to the first floor balconies have a height of 1.7 metres and are in the form of either timber screens or opaque glass screens. Councillor Fatakis, do you wish to speak? I just say echoing the, um, the words of uh, Councillor Loden on that. Any further comment in relation to the amendment? I'll put the amendment. All those in favour? 
I declare the uh, all those against. Sorry, Councillor Toppelberg. Councillor Toppelberg voting against. Um, we're back to the substantive. Are there any further comments in relation to this development, Councillor Toppelberg? Um, just a question to, uh, to the acting director. I'm not sure if you have the answer. And um, if you look at the iterations of the design as they've uh, come forward, is there any? Do we know at what point we ended up with a black roof? Because it certainly wasn't on the the proposal that was before the design review panel, at which point they made their comments in relation to not mimicking uh, the existing uh, design. What's come back has, uh, um, yeah, just, do, we, do we know at what point we ended up with a black roof? Through you, Mayor Cole, no, sorry. Councillors, any further comments or questions in relation to this item? Okay, I'll put it. All those in favour? All those against? Councillor Toppenberg against. Thank you. I declare it carried. Next item on the agenda is 9.1, number 12, Scott Street, Leaderville, Single House. Can I have a mover and seconder for this item, please? Moved Councillor Gondoshevsky, seconded Councillor Loden. Thank you, Mayor. I note the, um, in relation to this development that we received um, commentary in relation to the setback, um, both via the um, community consultation <coughs> process, which seemed to strongly suggest that the development should be set back, um, have a reduced setback to what is proposed, and also via the um, petition before us tonight in relation to requesting the, that the setback be modified to meet um, that set out in the deemed to comply criteria. Um, what we see is that the deemed to comply provision, um, the, the current street setback is proposed to be approximately 1.9 metres less than the deemed to comply provision. Um, I just have a question um, from the, to the Acting Director of Development Services, just in relation to the street setback calculation. Um, I'm going to presume that the setback of the lot fronting Burke Street was not included in the calculations of street setback for this dwelling. Is that correct? Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, that is correct. The, the property that's being referred to actually fronts a different street altogether, so it wasn't included as part of the calculations. So I think on this, and, and this is something that has come up before, I think that um, because we don't include um, the setback of the lot um, fronting Burke Street in our calculations, um, it, um, but I, I believe that the, the setback as presented to um, Scott Street um, is both of the, um, uh, the secondary street frontage of the house facing Burke Street as well as the neighbours down Scott Street. And I do um, note that the neighbouring dwelling on the corner facing Burke Street is, is approximately 1.5 metres back from Scott Street and that this proposal is generally in alignment with the setback of the southern neighbour. Um, we've also got the current um, garage of the Burke Street lot that has a minimal setback to Scott Street. Um, so... In, in regards to the setback, I believe that um, we will see sort of a stepping back towards, um, as we round the corner from Burke into Scott Street, um, that minimises the impact of the reduced setback in this regard. Um, and also we do see that there is um, landscaping that will moderate the impact of the development. Um, and um, I believe that there's been... Con um, that this is conditioned in relation to um, the um, compliance with built form. Um, so I'm supportive of the officer recommendation and um, in relation to um, the um, a development and including the reduced setback to Scott Street. And thank you, Councillor Toppelberg. There is also um, an amendment on the pink in relation to visual privacy um, to ensure that the um, development is compliant going forwards, which I would like to put forward now. Uh, Councillor Loden, are you happy to second, given that you were the seconder? It doesn't necessarily have to flow that way, but I thought I'd ask. Um, thank you. Do you wish to speak to the amendment, Councillor Gondoshevsky? Count Just to say that the amendment it relates to um, ensuring that there is screening um, to a height of 1.6 metres above the finished floor level. Um, 
so that um, it restricts there is views are restricted um, within the 7.5 metre cone of vision into the into any neighbouring properties. Councillor Lowden, do you wish to just speak to it? Anyone wish to speak to the amendment? I'll put the amendment. All those in favour? I declare the amendment carried. We're back to the substantive. Are there any further questions or comments on the substantive? You wish to speak? Thank you, Mayor. Yeah, um, I guess the the most contentious part around this for me was really the street setback, and the thing that particularly helps to um, mitigate that is that shed that's sitting there on the corner. You can see that very clear transition. There's been previous cases where we've seen this on corner blocks where you've had very small setbacks or even nil setbacks, and then as you work your way up the street, you see a transition back to a more standard setback for that. Uh, so given that, I'm happy to support the officer recommendation as well. Councillors, any further comments? Councillor Toppelberg. Thank you. Um, this is a really... Well, I will actually make some comment about uh, the way in which um, the petition was presented, and I do note Councillor Gontoshevsky's point that uh, the community consultation during that process was, if you read some of the language that's there, was about demanding uh, that the setback be reduced and that we have a one metre setback or nil setback to Scott Street, and that's turned into uh, vehement demand that we comply with the deemed to comply uh, provisions of, uh, of, of our, what is our policy, uh, not the R codes. So the, the, um, the setback does meet the provisions of the R codes, uh, what, is, what is proposed. And I think that uh, the, what has been proposed is a really good example. Uh, and I'm not making general architectural comment, but it is a really good example of where compliance doesn't necessarily equal with our vision for the area. One of the things that bothers me, and this is mostly for the future inhabitants of the dwelling, is that in order to meet their requirements, what I assume is their requirements for the physical space within the property, is that pretty much there is no access to northern light at all. You have highlight windows upstairs, which will provide some light, but there is actually no usable open uh, open area providing uh, any uh, any northern sun other than through highlight windows, and what's provided on the ground floor will essentially be blocked by the neighbouring development in its current format. And if you look at the pattern of development on Burke Street, and we heard tonight that 67 and 65 are owned by the same person, the likely scenario will be that that will be uh, developed to something of, of significance in future years. So uh, when I look at uh, page 21, uh, so attachment 2, when you look at that elevation, effectively that northern side of the building is uh, a uh, rendered square with a, a, a box roof on the top. And I, ju I just think that it's a, um, a, a, an outcome that is, that is largely compliant. Uh, as Councillor Loden pointed out, the issue, if you set aside the, uh, the setback issue, which has been talked about extensively, uh, the landscaping uh, concern has been mitigated through uh, a, pr um, a proposed condition. Uh, so we're really only dealing with the building with the building setbacks. Uh, I do, and and yeah, um, we're talking about a, a 50 centimetre setback. So look, it's it's. Uh, I think the representation from the local community that somehow that somebody who doesn't currently live in the area has any less rights to their to their uh, to their land than, than people who do currently live in the area I think is unfair uh, and the the representation that uh, planning or uh, development should be uh, a snap poll of uh, how the neighboring properties feel about a proposal uh, absolutely we take on board uh, comments and contributions made during consultation and we will look at uh, planning considerations and you know, things like the, the condition which uh, is designed to protect the amenity of the adjoining neighbours uh, in relation to the, uh, the alfresco area and the, and the visual privacy and meeting those requirements, that those things are within our power to do, but I don't think it's, uh, uh, that it's fair to demand that people change the look of their building uh, to suit uh, the neighbours. And as we've seen, it, it seems to be on a whim in this case because we were presented with two uh, completely diametrically opposed views within the, the space of about two months between advertising and today. So um, uh, that's, that's all from me for now. Councillors, any further comments? Councillor Patakis. Look, I agree with uh, Councillor Topperberg. Um, I certainly wouldn't have um, supported uh, a presentation of a street setback of uh, a metre or two metres, and I'm happy to support um, this proposal tonight. Um, I don't think it's a very good example of um, the uh, sort of structures uh, that I would envisage um, 
we would like to actually have in Vincent, but it uh, is mostly compliant, as Councillor Tobelberg has said. Um, I did note when reading, reading the plans um, that it is actually referred to as a one-off special, and I hope that's uh, the case moving forward, but I will actually support this uh, proposal. Councillors? Um, look, I will make some short comments. Um, there's no doubt that the messaging on the setback, front setback issue has been mixed, but I take the petition in good faith um, and in dealing with the setback where it stands and is recommended at six metres where the uh, deemed to comply is <coughs> 7.9. I think that a six metre setback on this street in this in this streetscape is acceptable. I think that to take it to 7.9 would be too far, um, not taking into consideration what is, what is existing there. Um, when you look at the other side of the road, for example, where we do see reduced setbacks and you see the development potential um, on that corner lot um, there, that, that could alter um, the way the streetscape works. Um, also that um, one metre is obviously uh, in a residential R40 area that would not be a good outcome either. So I believe that the uh, recommended six metre setback is, is right for this um, location at this time. Um, in relation to the canopy, it is conditioned to achieve the 30% tree canopy. Um, the, given that the deep soil zone is at 37.9%, there's absolutely capacity to meet the tree canopy and so therefore it has been um, conditioned. And uh, apart from that, issue of the street setback, the variations are very minor and um, whatever the feeling is on the development's um, design, um, and we are addressing these issues here tonight. I agree that it would be much better to maximise use of the northern, um, the northern uh, aspect um, to the north and I do agree with Councillor Toppelberg's comments um, but I don't feel that that's grounds to not approve the development before us tonight so I will be supporting it. Are there any further comments? I'll put it. All those in favour? I declare it carried unanimously. The next item is 9.5. And that is number 16 Howlett Street, North Perth, change of use from office to unlisted use doggy daycare. Thank you, Mayor. I'll move. <coughs> Moved Councillor Harley, seconded Councillor Hallett. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I, <coughs> pardon me, I don't support the officer's recommendation and I just want to <coughs> outline the reasons for that. <coughs> Sorry, I've got a frog in my throat. Um, I took a, a drive down through that area on the weekend. I, I know it quite well anyway, but <clears throat> I just wanted to um, imagine this particular business being in this particular location. Um, I'm surprised that some of the consultation, the consultation map went so far. Um, it was quite a distance away and none of the noise um, levels, even in worst case scenario, go anywhere near, in some of the cases, um, people um, at Hardy Street, nearly right up on Scrubber Beach Road or close to it um, on the um, western side were consulted. Um, that, be that as it may, I'm not surprised that if something like this was put out to a broad residential um, base, which it did to on the western, um, the western side of the proposal, that residents in the area may object. However, this area is a commercial zone. Um, the residential zone sits... Um, um, a, an entire property away, that the property that's adjacent to it, that the residential zone starts after that. Um, and actually is the first type of application we've had like this in the city of Vincent. And I think actually it's a service that's needed. Um, to be honest, many, we obviously have a large amount um, <clears throat> of dogs in the city of Vincent. Some years ago I'd heard that we have the highest dog ownership um, per capita in Australia. I'm not sure if that is still um, is still the case or not, but we are a, um, sorry to all the cat lovers, but we are a dog loving community and that means that occasionally services um, are called for, parks, uh, you know, furniture, memorial furniture, a whole range of things, as crazy as it sounds. But I think this is a sound application and I believe it's the type of um, business um, suitable for this area. Um, I don't accept the arguments about the loss of amenity. I do believe we've got enough regulation in place to deal with that. The noise report is comprehensive, um, laying out worst case scenarios, 
um, and they are fairly minimal. Um, there is a funeral parlour to one side, and frankly, I'd object more to having that near me if I was a resident. But it is there, and it's a very large car park. Um, there's, it's literally surrounded by um, commercial properties. There is a um, significant amount of street parking, um, which is um, um, timed but not um, paid parking. Um, so some of the issues that have been raised in this report I don't accept. Um, I've looked at some of the um, feedback provided through the consultation. I don't accept that either. I, I note, obviously, this is for refusal, um, and um, I would ask my fellow councillors not to support the refusal, and I would um, foreshadow that I would move an alternative motion to accept um, accept this proposal, um, and um, you know, obviously, listen to what other councillors have to say in regards to this, um, and see how the debate goes. Um, I guess the only thing I would say is, um, in terms of, um, and this is really for the business owner, um, and probably something f to be aware of is that amount of dogs in a backyard will inevitably lead to some issues in regards to degradation of the lawn area, um, if there's not going to be enough paving, etc. But all the issues that are raised, including waste and odour, I believe can be um, adequately um, dealt with. There are um, many options. Um, that dog owners have for those things, and I'm assuming a business owner would um, would be well aware of those as well. It is also providing a grooming a grooming service, and um, the few grooming um, places we have operating in the city, Vincent, I think we only have one bricks and mortar one is just booked out that far in advance. Um, you almost have to book, you know, four months in advance to get a to get a clipping. So I actually think it's a service our community um, will use and um, I'll leave it at that. Councillor Hallett. Thank you. Um, I certainly agree with um, Councillor Harley regarding the need for this type of service within um, Vincent. Um, I'm not as convinced that this is the right location and, and generally agree with the officers um, points regarding um, noise and amenity, um, although Councillor Harley has pulled me somewhat towards uh, her point of view, so I would be curious to see what other people um, have to say. But I, I think it's, it's one of those, the, a type of use that we haven't necessarily thought about much as a, as a council and um, doing a bit more um, of an environmental scan around geographic regions that um, these might be the most appropriate places to be, might be um, a useful step before we approve them. Councillors, Councillor Fatakis. Um, like Councillor Topperberg, I um, listened to Councillor Harley's. Um, I think you might mean Hallett. Oh, I, I think Councillor Topperberg's yeah, very sorry. Sorry, sorry Councillor Topperberg. Uh, Councillor Hallett, um, listened to Councillor Harley's um, words, and yeah, I was somewhat swayed. Um, but I go back to my original concerns with the location on that site. Um, there are significant amount of residents um, bounding that. I agree we are in need of a service like that in within um, within the city, um, but I'm not convinced that that is actually the right uh, right location for that service. And sorry, Councillor Toppelberg. Councillor Toppelberg. Just a question through you to the um, Director of Development Services. Uh, I haven't seen it come, so I assume we're in the absence of an alternative uh, recommendation. So, there's, I'll, just, well, I'll speak to that briefly. There's no way I'd support it on the fly. So, for me, it would have to be deferred if it's consideration of uh, of approval. But just in relation, just to get some idea of, uh, in the event that if council was of a mind to approve it, some of the conditions that you think uh, <coughs> would, would be able to be applied that would potentially mitigate some of the concerns that have been raised in the existing officer recommendation. I know it's a fairly convoluted question, that's why we have a briefing, but I just asked ask the question in terms of uh, some of the noise management, and perhaps m more so for people who are either considering it or for people who are uh, interested in the, uh, the application in principle, um, what compliance me measures would be available in the event that it was approved, if it was an issue, and that can be but the issues that are raised as the reasons for refusal, if they were to become a concern, I understand the conditions could mitigate them, but if it was to become a concern, what compliance uh, action would be open to the city in that event? Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, um, if Council was 
inclined to support the application, some of the conditions I would envisage would be, as discussed in the report, the, the waste management aspects, but in terms of the, the fundament, fundamental issue, which is around noise, um, the acoustic report does actually suggest there's some measures that could be implemented that would decrease the impact of noise somewhat, and that would be installing of uh, noise barriers like fencing and the like. I suppose one other option available to council, if it was so inclined, would be to reduce the number of dogs that the facility could actually accommodate. So, um, yeah, suffice to say, the fewer the, the dogs, um, the less impactful the noise. In addition, there could be um, requirements relating to the keeping of dogs inside uh, as opposed to letting them outside. Um, but I suppose without seeing an application in a revised acoustic report modelling any revised application, it would be just speculation at this stage. Thank you, Director. It is a timely reminder that if you don't support an officer recommendation for refusal, but to please flag early that you wish to move an alternate recommendation, because it's very difficult to do it on the night of the meeting. Are there any further comments? Councillor Gonoszewski? Um, like Councillor Harley, I also have taken a drive in the area. Um, and um, I think primarily my concern relates to um, the number of dogs that have been proposed to be in the outside area of looking at a, a maximum number of dogs on side of 30 with a split potentially of 15 inside, 15 outside. Um, and that whilst I accept the, um, the statement that it is unlikely that all 15 dogs in an outside area would bark, in a um, uh, at, at any one time, I, um, and that I think it is incredibly unlikely but that that would have happened on any ongoing basis. Um, I recognise that um, the the volume and tonality of dog barking um, can be um, quite impactful. Um, so I I, th I noticed that the. Um, the applicant did seem to be willing to perhaps consider a reduction in the number of dogs in the outside area um, where, and that this could be potentially assessed. Um, and I, I'm not, um, I don't feel that I could perhaps um, reinterpret the noise assessment on the basis of a reduced number of dogs myself. Um, however, I think given that there is some um, goodwill on the part of the applicant to um, consider adjusting the application, um, I, 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 I would perhaps foreshadow a deferral if they would, um, if after other councillors have had an opportunity to comment. Um, I'll just ask a question of the Director at this point. Director, um, where are we in the statutory time frame on this application? Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, the application was submitted on the 23rd of March, so we have basically just ticked over the 90 days. Uh, however, if the applicant was agreeable, uh, we could extend that out. Um, I'm not sure whether at this point, um, if the applicant is still here, yes. Um, I guess the options on the table are that we proceed to defer, but that would delay the application by one month. Um, is that something that you would be willing to to consider? Um, well, the options before council are to proceed and to deal with the refusal or to look at a deferral. Um, but I guess that given that the statutory time frame has gone over, about to tick over 90 days, it could be a deemed refusal regardless. So um, that I guess they're the options before us. It is not really possible to, to deal with an alternate recommendation this evening, given that there are a number of complex conditions that would be required. So I think really the options are to defer or to consider the refusal. Thank you, um, Chair. <clears throat> Point of order, um, just for the record, an alternative motion can actually be moved at any time during a debate. I appreciate the concerns and issues raised and I take note of that, but just um, a, and a council member may move an alternative um, motion at any point um, where a refusal's um, before them um, and they wish to have another um, motion on the table. Um, but I take note of that and I will put in um, alternative uh, motions in advance. It's also been of long-standing um, practice in this council um, as well. But having said that, um, I want to move a deferral motion. 
Do I have a seconder? Councillor Toppelberg. All those in favour? All those against? Council of Tarkas against. I declare the, the uh, item has been deferred and I would request that administration please liaise with the applicant and bring that back to next month's council meeting. Thank you. Next item on the agenda is 9.4, number 33A, Redfern Street, North Perth, grouped dwelling. Do I have a mover and seconder for this item? Moved, Councillor Gondoshevsky. Seconded, Councillor Loden. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I'll be up front uh, with this one. I've driven Macri Lane. I've looked at the designs <coughs> and I've looked at the changes that have been made. Um, I'm supportive of the officer recommendation. I think this is a small lot with significant constraints. It's not the only lot that has been subdivided in this manner with a public access way leading to um, Redfern Street um, and, and, a, and a reasonably small lot at the rear. Um, we've, we're seeing the retention of a front dwelling and um, I think that Macri Lane will benefit from um, increased passive surveillance and, um, and I think that some of the changes that have been made to the design will support that. I think in this environment we are likely to see um, variations from the deemed to comply criteria and I believe that's why we have a planning framework that supports this flexibility. Um, having variations from the deemed to comply criteria and um, undertaking a um, design principle assessment um, isn't a subsidiary path to approval, it is a valid path to approval. Um, I think that, um, I, I will be, be honest, I, I think that we see, um, I, I'm pleased that the applicant has um, is keen to work with the city in relation to um, landscaping and that, um, that the landscape plan will be um, part of the condition of approval. So that's an important part of this approval. Um, but ultimately, I, um, I think that there has been a subdivision approved that uh, creates a small lot on the site, and um, I'm supportive of the officer recommendation in this regard. Thank you, Councillor Loden. Um, Two questions uh, through the Chair to the Director of Development Services. Um, firstly, one of the points raised was around open space and the consideration of the access way. So I was wondering if the Director could provide some feedback as to what, how much, how big this piece of um, land is, the access way, and also as to why, what, what was the justification for that being included as part of the open space calculation? Through you, Mayor Cole, the, the access way has an area of approximately 28 square metres. Uh, in terms of its eligibility as open space, you would have all seen emails uh, over the last couple of days regarding the interpretation of the R codes, but to, I'll, I'll repeat it for the, for the sake of completeness. Um, the term open space is a defined term within the R codes and is defined as generally that area of a lot not occupied by any buildings and includes various things, uh, open areas of accessible and usable flat roofs, areas beneath eaves, verandas, patios, unroofed structures, etc. but excludes other things that are not, uh, not accessible or relate to covered car parking bays and, and the like. Um, the area that we have in front of us, the 28 square metre area, um, is open, it's uncovered by buildings. It provides uh, pedestrian access from the proposed dwelling out to the street and can be landscaped. So uh, officers or administration have assessed that as appropriately qualifying as open space um, and the report has been structured accordingly. Uh, there is, There has been the assertion that the definition of private open space is more applicable in this case. Uh, however, I would reiterate uh, my previous comments that the, um, 
the R codes provision that we're talking about, uh, clause 5.1 of the codes, refers to the def defined term of open space as opposed to the defined term of private open space. And for that reason, uh, administration have correctly assessed the application. Thank you. And my second question was just around uh, the condition 5.1 around a landscaping plan to be agreed between the city and the applicant. Uh, when the city works with the applicant on this, uh, does it take into consideration impacts on the neighbours? So, for example, the, the issue of sunlight uh, into the, the neighbours' rear property as well? Through you, Mayor Cole, the, the assessment or the preparation of the plan and the resultant assessment can absolutely take that into account. Uh, in terms of assessing the canopy cover on the site, uh, or the canopy cover of any application, it is generally taken that any canopy that falls outside the subject site and into a neighbouring property is not counted on the basis that it is open to the abutting landowner to potentially remove that canopy. So in terms of the 16% that's been quoted in the officer report, that is 16% on the subject site. If it, obviously in terms of the preparation and assessment of any such plan, it would need to be sympathetic to the abutting neighbours and we can assure that occurs. And just to follow up on that, so that's in terms of looking at the, the specified height of those trees that would be planted to um, support solar access. Through you, Mayor Cole, it would relate to the height and the, the breadth of the actual canopy as well. Um, so I similarly support the officer recommendation on this item. I recognise this is a challenging uh, item and there's concerns from neighbours on this um, and that this has gone around twice now. So the, the, developer, the developer has gone to significant efforts to, to change that development to be more sympathetic in that regard. Um, we can't please everybody but um, I'm happy to support the officer recommendation. Councillors, Councillor Toppelberg. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Just um, a few comments. Firstly, just in relation to the lot itself. So there's, uh, in the deputation uh, that we had from Mr Harris, he referred to the issue of the, uh, the northern setback and the, uh, the rear of the property at uh, um, number 33. But at some point, the owner of 33 has decided to subdivide that lot. Uh, the re minimum requirements under R40 for a battle axe block is for it to be 380 square metres. Uh, the minimum lot size is 180 with an average of 220. Uh, the uh, subdivision, at some point that owner has decided to subdivide the lot and create a small lot. Uh, and if you look where the battle axe uh, block decision was uh, relaxed, it's still significantly greater than the minimum lot size, which could have been reduced to 180 square metres, providing a sig more significant setback. Uh, to that northern boundary, so I'm not sure whether that's the current uh, occupant of that property or not, but at some point that owner of that lot made that decision and either these two lots were created and at some point the current uh, owners of this lot have purchased it in that state. So I think that uh, the, either that existing owner is still in 33 or the person has bought it with the full knowledge that that is the setback that they have uh, to, the, to the adjoining lot. So uh, I think that the issue of the northern setback uh, and the impact that that creates is largely due to the approval of the subdivision, which is not a uh, City of Vincent matter, that's a, a WAPC matter, um, but it's certainly, uh, the block is developable uh, in this way. Um, look, I, I've got some, uh, and I, I think also, I also will just make some comment about some of the correspondence we've received and some of the comments tonight. Uh, Mayor made some comments about neighbourly relations or otherwise, but uh, as the CEO rightly pointed out in his correspondence, this isn't about uh, individuals making decisions. This is about officers of the city uh, putting forth recommendations to council. And I will also note that the uh, DA that was originally to come to the last council meeting was not tested at council and we do not know whether that recommendation itself would have been supported. So the idea of comparing one with the other or attributing it to individuals I think is unfair. It's an, it's an assessment of uh, the DA that is before the officer in, in their uh, role as a professional, as a planning professional at the time and that's what we have before us. Um, in terms of the design, some of the, for me, uh, the the key issue, the key issue for me, I think that actually uh, creates that the, the the issues that are that exist on Macri Lane, the issues of open space and the issue of openness to the design, uh, actually would not be mitigated, and that that's the, the the garage and the design of the garage. I think that it's 
big. Uh, I don't understand why, but I think in this day and age, and given the nature of it, we probably could have got a better outcome if we were to uh, have had a single car, uh, single car garage there. I think it would have mitigated almost all of the planning issues that are presented in terms of the western side or otherwise. It would have perhaps been an amenity issue for the future occupants, but it certainly would have had no impact at all uh, um, uh, on the, the, the occupants of uh, number 31 uh, Redfern. Uh, I note that 31 Redfern uh, has been uh, um, extended uh, and, a, and a garage built uh, to the rear, and the nature of the double storey extension means that the likelihood of that being developed in a similar way to this in the future is, uh, uh, is unlikely. Um, and so what we have certainly in that conflict or that relationship between the proposal here uh, and uh, what exists at 31 is likely to be an issue, whatever is built on this site. Uh, and uh, the, the idea that uh, I actually think that the, um, and there will be, I'm sure, discussion as it gets to building licence stage about the appropriateness of species, but the <coughs> idea that uh, a landscaped boundary is somehow imposing more of a uh, more of a, uh, of a problem or, or more of a, a um, an impact on the amenity than it would be if, if it was left uh, left clear, I think is uh, both unfair to the applicant and is not in line with, with, with the principles of how people uh, like to live. This is an R40 site, which whilst it is relatively uh, low coding within uh, the city of Vincent, is not a low density area. R40 is medium density. Uh, it is defined uh, as such and sits on the cusp in, of, uh, of that definition uh, within the R codes. Um, look, I, I will support the officer recommendation. I do uh, completely understand the concerns uh, of the neighbour. I think that having anything uh, of that size built that in that proximity to your property is of concern and will absolutely have an impact on amenity, but I see no planning basis for us to be able to refuse the, the proposal on the basis of those objections. Uh, and as I've spoken about the setback to the north, and I think that the setback to the west, as I say, for me, the upper floor I'm not as concerned with. Uh, um, and the issue that I have mostly is with the garage, but given that it current, it, it's proposed to abut an existing garage uh, and that will be the existing built form for any future development, I'm comfortable with the officer recommendation. Councillors? OK, I will make some comments in relation to this application. Um, in relation to the issue of what has changed since this was last um, put to council briefing but then withdrawn um, back in the May meeting, uh, there have been a number of changes that I do think are meaningful and those changes are is that the front setback has changed from 1 metre to 1.5 metre. The setback to level 1 of the northern lot boundary is now compliant. The setback to the um, northern lot boundary on level two has um, gone from 3.1 to 3.4 metres. In relation to public open, the, sorry, not um, public open space, that's another matter altogether entirely. In relation to the open space um, issue, I do agree with the, with the director's interpretation of what, public, what open space and how that's interpreted under the um, the R codes and that it's not about, the consideration is not, although it may be way more practical, the consideration before us is not to address private open space but is to, is to address open space. And this is open space in a wholly contained and singly owned lot as opposed to private open space which is a concept that is often used in multi dwellings. Um, where you do have um, open space versus private open space for particular residents within those um, dwellings. So in terms of the interpretation of what open space is, while I agree in principle that using a public access way as open space is not particularly practical, I believe that that is what is before us in terms of how we must consider it. And when you look at the information that the director gave us in relation to um, what is open space, it particularly talks about excluding covered walkways. So I think that it, it is very clear when you look at the fact that it's describing things like what is included being uncovered driveways, including access aisles and car parking areas, and what is excluded are covered walkways. So I take that to be expressly meaning that walkways that are uncovered are um, enclosed, uh, included in open space. So um, in terms of where that's at, it has slightly increased since last time round and where we do require 45% open space the 
proposal before us is at 44.5%, so it is a minor variation. Um, in relation to um, the visual permeability of the front fence, that has now um, come into compliance, and I do believe that that is important because I think that the way in which development interacts and um, and presents to the to the right of way is important in these emerging streetscapes that we're finding on our rights of way as our suburbs do densify. I take um, in also sorry in terms of the. Um, Western setback. I do have a question. There was a, there, there has been an issue that's sort of been brought um, to light about the actual boundary wall location versus the surveyed um, boundary on the west side. And I just wanted to ask whether the um, the level one measurement has been taken from the uh, boundary wall um, in situ or from the um, surveyed boundary wall, director. If that has any potential impact on whether that brings that set back into compliance? Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, uh, city staff have recently been made, been made aware of uh, a suggested encroachment issue, uh, which was referred to by the applicant in her deputation. Um, city staff have subsequently reviewed uh, the survey strata plan that was prepared as part of the subdivision proposal, uh, and it would seem to be that there is an issue there that would need to be resolved. Um, in terms of what that would mean for this application, um, it would, assuming uh, there was no encroachment issue, uh, it would be open to effectively relocate um, the proposed dwelling to be on the, uh, the legal cadastral boundary as opposed to abutting the existing garage. If that were to occur, you'd effectively be swapping some compliance. Uh, you'd be increasing some compliance on the western side, but you would, in return, you'd be reducing compliance on the eastern side. So the, the compliance assessment would effectively net out to zero. However, the act of moving it towards the east would actually give you a, a larger and therefore you know, more usable, more practical, contiguous outdoor living area. Uh, in the northwest corner of the site, um, but in terms of the uh, encroachment issue itself, that would be a civil matter between the parties. And that's understood. So, um, just wanted to query if that had an impact on on the um, on the variations before us. So, thank you for clarifying that. Um, so, look in terms of um, in terms of the landscaping alternatives to canopy. I agree that canopy is always best. Um, but there has been a significant attempt to try to to address this, the landscaping um, alternatives since the last time this was before council. In particular, I think that the the um, the growing of the jasmine across the open balcony at the front is is something that I welcome. Um, in relation to the garage non-compliance, um, the garage is uh, at 52% of the setback area front. Set, um, setback as opposed to 50% and we have had the discussion about the setback to the right of way being 1.5 metres and um, I do have come to the view that I think that 1.5 metres setback off the right of way given that um, we're dealing with lots of garages that are not set back and that we do have other f developments further along um, that this this is a I think this is a reasonable setback to to be seen in the, on Macri Lane um, as Councillor Toppelberg has mentioned, this is a medium density area and the decision on the lot size was really made during the subdivision process through the WA Planning Commission. Um, there have been issues raised around solar access and prevailing winds and um, the impact has been highlighted to the neighbour in relation to their rear living area of 31 Redfern Street and I do understand that this will have an impact but given that the solar access is compliant it's not really open to council to, um, to deal with that particular issue. So overall in going through this in some detail I do believe that this is now supportable and I will be, um, be supporting the officer recommendation. Are there any further comments? Okay, I'll put it. All those in favour? I declare it carried.
The next item on the agenda is item 9.7, which is the North Perth Common Concept Design. Do I have a mover and seconder for this item? Move Councillor Toppelberg, seconded Councillor Hallett. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I, I will address the um, proposed removal of the ficus tree, given that it was brought up in public uh, question time. So this, uh, uh, this is, well, the, the process to get to here, as everybody knows, has been the result of um, a significant uh, process with the community and consultation that began with the question of what is what is missing in the North Perth Town Centre, and that was something, the idea of a uh, um, a public space that was uh, green, accessible, um, either uh, purpose built or or uh, potentially being able to be blocked off to be able to have uh, some sense of town square or events or otherwise. Uh, this location was chosen through, uh, selected through a process of consultation, and I guess the leaving the design aesthetics aside, the three key issues that were dealt with in terms of uh, the, the this as a location was the existence of two-way traffic, and that was discussed and investigated uh, and decided that uh, the design should be such that if at a future date there was some provision to be able to remove the traffic either in both directions or one direction, that that would be uh, possible, so that the design wouldn't preclude that, but that it would uh, be sympathetic to it, but also understand that it is a major access route and given the no right turn currently that exists out of Alma Road uh, and, it's, and it being the primary access also to uh, the local primary school, uh, that it, or a, a primary access, uh, that the volumes of, of traffic, whether it was uh, with some data that was there, but, the, um, but uh, the, the volumes of traffic would mean that it would be near on impossible to, uh, to remove the traffic at this point. Um, the second issue was the car parking, uh, and it was the working group that uh, looked at that pretty much unanimously decided to delete all the existing car parking in the area um, and return that space to uh, to the community and to pedestrian use uh, rather than uh, to vehicle use, and that's uh, broadly supportable. There are actually four issues, not three, now that I think of it. The other was the undergrounding of potential undergrounding of power. Uh, I did say at the very first meeting that if we didn't underground the power, I wouldn't support the design in any form. Uh, that was before we'd really seen uh, what the design was going to look like, but I thought it was it just didn't make any sense to me. And then given uh, partly the cost, but also the fact that the design that we've come up with is actually able to be accommodated within the, 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 the setback provisions that are required. Um, uh, and I think I also, I also recalled at a time where we had some discussions about undergrounding power in uh, the area around uh, Brooklyn and Moyer Street that we actually received... Uh, a number of submissions from people talking about how much they loved the power poles and how much they uh, uh, reflected the heritage and, and, and the time of, uh, of the, uh, the, the, the mid-century. So I thought, well, yeah, perhaps it, do it does have value. And the last issue which I will talk to is the tree. So the, um, this was the subject of discussion for many hours uh, about the tree, the species, uh, the fact that it's evergreen, the shade that it provides, the historic value in terms of providing, uh, particularly as it's got a seat sitting under it, and certainly... Uh, in summer, that it, it provides much-needed relief. Uh, conversely, in the winter time, as a, uh, a an extremely dense evergreen that's been trimmed under the power lines and is essentially a flat hat for the area, it provides uh, dark and cold uh, space uh, through much of the winter, and uh, it's not it's not a particularly accommodating environment. Even in the sunny winter days, it's an extremely cold and dark uh, space under there. Um, we looked at opportunities to prune it. We looked at opportunities to move it. Uh, we even looked at opportunities to be able to make furniture out of parts of it. Uh, none of those were viable, and that wasn't just economics. It was practicality in terms of the tree itself. And uh, the working group really looked at uh, what the intention, intention was for the space overall. And for me, the reason that we have... Uh, um, and I did make some comment, by the way, about the uh, fact that the trees that are depicted in the design at this stage are all deciduous and that perhaps we should be looking at, at a mix of both deciduous and evergreen. But trees should provide a certain level of amenity in, visually. It should provide uh, relief from, uh, from the heat. It should provide shade. It should also provide uh, um, uh, some relief and canopy uh, where there is inclement weather as well. And uh, I, I think that the uh, overall, whilst the loss of the tree was uh, accepted by uh, the group as being something that was going to be... Uh, detrimental uh, to the area, the outcome we're going to deliver is a far better uh, space. And I think we are looking at something, if you take the space as a whole, we're moving from something 
like 10 per cent to, and I can't remember, it may even be in the report, but the, the, the net gain in terms of uh, coverage is something uh, like five or six times the, the canopy coverage that, that was there. So uh, it's not an, an issue that was glossed over. It's not something that was uh, looked at as a blank site. We did investigate and look to try and retain the tree, but ultimately uh, what we're delivering is uh, a number of other uh, trees that will um, frame the space and also provide those benefits that we look for in our green canopy. So I uh, won't comment much further on the design. I support uh, the officer recommendation and look forward to seeing it happen in the next 12 months. Thank you, Councillor Toppelberg. Uh, Councillor Hallett. Thank you. Um, no further comment beyond... Um, I, I, I would likewise, um, I guess, to the public gallery, was dismayed at the idea of um, losing the tree but um, in the early stage, but after the discussion, I'm confident that the replacement of um, far more canopy um, outweighs that um, impact. Through you, Matt. Um, yes, I'm obviously very supportive of, um, of this and the creation of a... Um, a common space and a place where um, we're going to be able to hold um, venues and um, events and concerts, um, et cetera. <clears throat> um, I, I understand the comments and the work that was done in regards to the two-way traffic. Um, I did ask last week whether there'd been a traffic flow study and um, I don't believe there had been um, <clears throat> in regards to the traffic, midweek traffic versus weekend traffic because there's different different uses um, for that traffic. I understand there's lots of um, dead ends and um, you know, um, no right turns, etc. <clears throat> I think we're missing an opportunity. So I think it would be good to keep sight of this space to be converted into either no traffic or at a minimum only one-way traffic um, heading east down View Street and turning left onto Fitzgerald Street. Um, the debate we had going back some time in the Leadable, <clears throat> the Oxford Reserve open space um, that's been created was went back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. And um, not to disparage a former, <clears throat> a former elected member in any way, but there were divergent views. The view that won out is the view that is there now. And if any of you can imagine that alfresco space being a car park and two-way traffic, um, you would understand the ferocity with which um, <clears throat> those debates occurred. And the right outcome was made for, for that area, even though at the time businesses and other people said it was you know, going to ruin the area and we would lose valuable parking. So I do understand <clears throat> the notion of needing to keep the traffic going, um, but it would be really good to see at some future point even um, weekend closure perhaps after a study flow plan, so you can see how different the traffic is there on the weekend and the usage, Monday to Friday when school is open versus Saturdays um, and Sundays. Perhaps we could look at um, some, you know, some shared space like that or at the very um, minimum one-way traffic. Councillors? Councillor Lowden? Uh, just a quick question around uh, once detailed design is complete, I assume that comes back to Council for endorsement, is that correct? Through you, Mayor Cole, the detailed design won't come back to a Council meeting um, for endorsement, but will be discussed with Council members um, through a Council workshop. Um, similarly, I'm happy to support the officer's recommendation. I think this is going to be a great addition to the North Perth common. Um, I guess two comments I'd like to make as we go into detailed design is the three rings. Um, there's an opportunity there to make them red, yellow and black, uh, which would reflect the Aboriginal flag. A great opportunity there for us to acknowledge the uh, traditional as of the land. And similarly, Dog Swamp uh, is a site of significance for the Aboriginal people to the north. And we have Hyde Park, Robertson Park and Stones Lake, both all, all three of them being to the south. So without knowing the realities, I would be, I would expect that that Fitzgerald Street is a traditional transit route for the Noongar people and that if we could come up with a name for North Perth Common that reflected something along those lines or something more appropriate as identified with uh, uh, Noongar people, with the, the, the knowledge holders in that area, I think that would be a great uh, inclusion as part of the detailed design process. Thank you. 
councillors. Well, look, I'm going to comment. I think there's so much to be excited about here. We've focused on some of the constraints and the negative aspects of this project, but this is absolutely a fantastic project. We went to the community and we said, first of all, what location would you like this square to be in? And secondly, what elements would you like to see? So this wasn't plucked from the sky. This was actually a consultation process with our community. And they said, oh, you know, the overwhelming view was that View and Newcastle Street was where it was needed. Angove Street is already doing pretty well as a streetscape. We needed to try to, you know, bring some sense of place to Fitzgerald Street and this was the ideal location. We then asked them what sort of things would you like to see and do in the space. They said they wanted a shaded place to sit and meet. They wanted to host events. They wanted to be inspired by public art, to, for the space to be lit up at night and for it to be focused on cars and on people and not cars. So I think that this concept takes the constraints that are before us and really takes those elements, takes a location and delivers a really fantastic outcome. The, the space is designed to be flexible. At the moment we do have the constraints of Elmer Road being a, a left turn only because originally, uh, because that was identified as a black spot. I do think we need to do some traffic modelling. We've got now a 40 kilometre zone along Fitzgerald Street. It's not always adhered to and there are speeding issues on that road. But the question has been asked, does that then have any impact on whether Elmer, Elmer Road is still a black spot and that, that work needs to be done? But in terms of actually allowing access and maximising the public open space, it has significantly increased and will increase from the verge that is currently there. And the, um, the two-way traffic is really pushed out um, from that um, verge to the... Uh, uh, south is pushed out to the north and it does create a much bigger space. Um, the, the, design, the designers were tasked with incorporating artwork from the beginning into this space and not to do this as an afterthought and so the artwork which is the three circles um, that, that, that sort of appear to float in the sky and that will be illuminated at night reflect the circle pattern that you'll see on the pavement and that circle pattern is something that can be repeated up View Street into the future when the long term vision is to link the North Perth Common through the View Street car park and to make that connection through to Angove Street. Um, I don't necessarily agree that then changing the colours to red, yellow and black without actually having a local Noongar artist involved from the, from the very outset would be culturally appropriate. I'm happy to have further discussions on that, but I think that if we were going down that line in terms of wanting to make that some kind of significant artwork and to bring Noongar elements into that, that that would have been essential to do that from the very beginning. Um, and I do wholeheartedly agree that if we could keep the ficus in place, take out the power lines and take out the traffic, absolutely, that would be fantastic. But we are doing what we can with what the constraints are now here today. And I believe that the space is adaptable. And in the future, if we can find alternative traffic flows, that is something that we should be seeking to do. But for here and now, it's adaptable, it presents a great outcome for the space, and it presents also that longer term plan for the connection. I think the canopy outcome is good, really good. The loss of the ficus tree is not something that Council takes easily. It was something that was, has had much <coughs> discussion, and um, it's not something that we do um, in a fickle or um, non, not contemplated in a sort of uh, deep way. As Councillor Tobelberg has outlined, many different options were considered um, in terms of relocation, reuse of the tree, etc. Um, and the power lines, yes, absolutely would love to see those taken down. We have, we do understand that in the future, if we can come up with the additional two hundred to four hundred thousand dollars, which is just a rough estimate from Western Power, that we can sink the power lines and tunnel through under the common without having to do extensive. Um, we wouldn't have to remove um, extensive paving to do that because of the techniques that um, our utility companies now use for tunnelling, as you've seen, around the place with pipes for Perth. So um, I think it's really exciting. It's part of a long-term plan to provide that further connection. And also just like to say, um, acknowledge that it was Councillor Hallett that came up with the common title. Um, at first I wasn't convinced, I did think of the Wombles of Wimbledon, but now I really like it. 
Um, and I'd also just like to say thank you to the working group who um, worked through the design process. And on that working group, we had two members of North Perth Local, um, Edith Smithwick and Andrew Ryan, who are the chair and the vice chair. Um, we had Manira Mackay, who gave her time um, of, of um, through passion for public, um, public open space, and she's a, a, a city's um, design review panel member. Um, we also had uh, the member for Perth, John Kerry, MLA represented, given that there has been a $250,000 contribution from the state government on this project. So um, I think that we've done really well with what we've got in this space, and this is a really exciting initiative for North Perth, and I can't wait to see it constructed next financial year. Are there any further comments? Okay, I'll put it. All those in favour? I declare it carried. Okay, we'll try to complete the development services items. We've got two left. It's 9.2 and 9.8. So item 9.2 is number 14, Orange Avenue, Perth, second storey addition to a group dwelling. I have a mover, Councillor Toppelberg, seconder, Councillor Hallett. Thank you, Mayor Cole. I assume that the fact that it took the round of the sixth elected member to pull it out, that uh, it will likely be uh, approved as recommended. I just wanted to make a couple of comments. Uh, <coughs> the opportunity afforded to the applicant to make changes, uh, there's no question that the um, What's there is more compliant, and that largely has to do with the removal of some of the uh, the east-facing uh, windows, which posed overlooking issues, uh, the obscuring of some of the uh, the, the other windows that are there, um, the change in materials. Uh, I will leave it to the individual to judge whether that is a better or worse outcome for the streetscape. But the um, the applicant has at least made or recognised that. Uh, that was something that needed to be considered. I guess um, uh, the, the, the issue, the reason I did want to uh, talk to it was the issue of height. And I guess, given the concerns and the uh, very specific concerns that the neighbour to uh, to the south had in relation uh, to the height of the property, and whilst yeah, we're, we're talking about uh, 20 centimetres, 200 mil, if you look at the uh, proposed ceiling heights within the, within the upper floor. Uh, they are 2.435 metres, which uh, affords the opportunity. It's absolutely only 200 mil, and uh, that that argument, I guess, can fall on either side. And it's only 200 mil to the applicant as well to be able to make uh, to make that change. And I guess, um, whilst on paper, and I know that we had in the uh, uh, initial um, presentation to council, we had some images of the uh, adjoining property, and uh, the report suggests that. The, um, effect would be minimal, but that may well be 15 minutes of light at a certain time of day or otherwise. And for me, I think that uh, my attitude with a DA of this nature is fairly simple. Uh, if you are prepared to make things compliant, there's little that we can say, but where you are asking for discretion to be exercised, you need to be providing something uh, to the street and to, uh, to the community and to the future occupants that is uh, above and beyond. For me, it doesn't personally, it doesn't meet that test. Um, and I know that it is a minor technicality, but I'd happily go to war on it on this one personally. So that's why I pulled it out and I will be um, opposing it. I think that that is something that is arguable and could easily have been changed by the applicant and could be something that could be mediated out, but I will um, let people vote as they please. Councillor Gondoshevsky, was that you? Sorry. No, oh, sorry, Councillor Hallett. No? Okay. Councillors? No further comments? Um, I would love to go down this path with you, Councillor Toppelberg. I'm just not sure if there's enough there to, to go down that path. Um, in terms of some of the issues that the neighbour has raised about um, the way in which the top floor interacts with their um, louvers um, near their, their carport, uh, sorry, their, their garage and their um, bathroom window, etc. I think that the overshadowing difference in the height falls to the roof space and doesn't make, um, unfortunately, doesn't have a difference in relation to the amenity issues that the, the neighbour has raised. 
Um, I don't necessarily believe that the changes made to the, the to the design in relation to adding awnings, etc., have have made it look more attractive. Um, but whether it's whether it's um, something to refuse, I just don't know that it's it's at that point. So it is a bit of a struggle sometimes to vote in favour of approving these developments and I do feel the pain but I'm just not sure um, there are sufficient grounds to refuse it and that the grounds that have been raised by the neighbour in terms of um, how it overshadows and interacts with their, um, the, the windows that they highlighted, I just don't think that that would go to dealing with those issues. Councillors, Councillor Gonshevsky. Look, I'll speak up. I I appreciate that sometimes it's a we have a, a sort of an internal dialogue around whether we can support something that may be considered on the edge. I note this was um, sent this was deferred in relation to streetscape setbacks, bulk and scale, and visual privacy. We've seen the setbacks uh, reduced by 0.51 metres, and we've seen um, the visual privacy concerns addressed in relation to windows. I think this is still really impactful on the streetscape, like really impactful on the streetscape. And the introduction of the EVE, I don't believe, um, mediates that. And I think that it will impact the amenity of this residential street. And I, um, I don't feel that I can support this recommendation. Councillors? All right, I'll put it. All those in favour? All those against? You won me over. Councillor Gonshevsky. <laughs> so can I can't just have those against hands in the air. Have you got that? Got it. Thank you. So So I declare that refused. Um, through you, Mayor Cole, uh, just as a point of note, um, similar to the earlier item on the dog daycare that was refused, the, um, the fact that Council has not adopted the officer recommendation constitutes a non-decision. So unless there is an alternative pursued, I'd have to discuss it with the Acting Director uh, because my recollection is that this is well outside the 90-day deemed refusal period and consequently it may well reappear on the council agenda next month. Um, uh, sure, yes, it's open to council to pursue an alternative, but we will need an alternative of some sort in order for a reversal of the officer recommendation and to constitute a proper refusal. Councillor Toppelberg. I thought we were on the Gondoshevsky train now. <laughs> I think the grounds for refusal would have to relate to the impact um, on the streetscape and the amenity of, I mean, primarily the, the amenity impact and to, the, to, this, to the streetscape and the southern over, yes. Um. Through you, Mayor Cole, I'm not sure if the Acting Director has anything further to add, but um, just reviewing page 31 of the agenda papers um, and from the discussion, I glean that there's also a concern that council members might have in relation to the proposed southern and northern boundary setbacks. Yes. If that's the case, then that ought to be included. Is the height something that you wish to raise, Councillor Toppelberg? I mean, given that it's the impact on the streetscape, then I do the, believe that the height yeah, goes the height to that. Yeah, would be an issue. Height. I don't think that uh, the southern boundary ground level setback is uh, has an impact, but the northern boundary uh, also relates to that reduced setback, which has impact on the, the size and its view from the street.
Excuse me. Chair, may I ask a question? Yes, Councillor. Sorry, is there an alternative um, motion being developed for this? Yes, there is. Thank and you. given it's a refusal, it's not so, quite so complex as an approval. So, and as you've pointed out, it is open to council members to do so. Thank you. Okay, so the alternate motion before us is that council is refusing the application on the grounds of impact on the streetscape amenity and northern boundary setback due to the size and view of the uh, development and view from the street. Can I have a mover for that item, please? Councillor Gonchewski, seconded Councillor Toppelberg. Do you wish to speak to the alternate motion? Councillor Toppelberg, do you wish to speak to it? Any councillors wish to speak to this? Um, yes, I actually, I do believe this is more complicated and taking a point that was made to me earlier, um, if this is not more complicated than a doggy daycare, I'm not sure what is. So. Um, just to put on the record the uh, Councillor Harley, I'll call you to order because Thank that's you, not relevant to the matter before Thank us. You, so please Noted. refrain. Thank you. Any councillors wish to speak to the item before us? Okay, I'll put it. All those in favour? All those against? I declare the alternate motion carried. Moving on to item 9.8, Business Advisory Group Key Priorities. Can I have a mover for this item? Councillor Toppelberg, seconded. Councillor Hallett. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to speak. I didn't speak at the briefing because that's question time, so I'll just uh, speak to it um, now. So just explain a little bit about the genesis of this. I guess the uh, Business Advisory Group has had a few iterations since its uh, inception a few years ago, um, and this was part of a process uh, which began uh, as literally uh, post-it notes on a, on a board, um, but effectively it was trying to ensure that the group was aware of its, uh, of its direction and, and what it was trying to achieve, uh, but also uh, there's a broad array of, uh, as the Business Advisory Group sits currently under uh, the um, Planning Directorate um, or Development Services uh, and looking at some of the economic development work that's being done, some of the town team uh, and town centre work that's being done. And I guess this was a process of the <coughs> advisory group uh, working out together with uh, with administration exactly what the role of the group was and also being distinctly different from the work that's being done uh, within exclusively within town centres. Um, so whilst it, uh, uh, and I guess, uh, and it did look prettier than it appears in the, uh, in, the, in the agenda papers, and thank you to uh, Ms Smith for uh, uh, making it look appropriate for council agenda, but it, it, it was uh, it, it was effectively uh, a comment from the group about the issues that they uh, and and I guess seeking endorsement from where we're at now is about seeking endorsement from council that this is a path that between the advisory group itself, but also the body of work being undertaken in the economic development space over the next 12 to 24 months by uh, um, the development services and, and associated um, offices within the city, that those uh, would be aligned and that they would also be endorsed by council. Uh, I note that the mayor did point out a couple of things uh, did seem to be a little bit vague and they probably have been transfers from uh, post-it notes too. So they're not, it's not a, uh, there has been a lengthy discussion about what's here, but I guess it's, uh, uh, making sure that that process of the advisory group fulfilling its role and having that conversation with council and ensuring the direction that it is heading uh, has the endorsement of council. And um, yeah, there's, uh, uh, there are a number of things that are evolving and it's probably, um, as I said, taken a, a few years for the uh, group to get its, uh, to find its, its groove and, and find, it, find it its path forward. But this is a part of that process. And um, as the economic development strategy is reviewed and evolves, I think that we'll see some of these embedded in some of that detail that uh, I think the Mayor was seeking in her questions last week will uh, evolve from there. So I thought it was important to put that commentary around it. Thank you, Councillor Tobelberg. Councillor Hallett. Thank you. Um, I support this. Just a couple of comments, I guess, to draw on um, something that Councillor Tobelberg mentioned. Um, I think recently we've seen, um, or at least I've seen, I guess, a bit more visible activity being undertaken by the city around economic development, and not to say that the stuff wasn't already happening, um, but certainly the town team work is, um, has been very front and centre, um, but it's, I think this is a great opportunity to have a, a bit more of a conversation around what we're doing for um, economic development in some of the other areas, um, whether that's Claysbrook um, or um, some of West Perth, um, which haven't necessarily had the same level of um, support or um, initiatives associated with them. Um, 
I'm not too concerned about some of the vagueness in some of the items. Um, when I see reduced red tape as a um, thing, I'm not sure that's always a, a useful um, thing, but I understand that there are specific things related to that that um, might be of interest, um, but that's not enough for me to vote against it, so happy to support it. Through you, Chair. Yes. I'm um, just wanting to um, know through the Director how this advisory group may interact or be interdependent with the RAP um, working group, given it's about um, helping small business, um, you know, building through the local economy. I wonder if there's an interdependency or an aspect that can be um, included in the business advisory group. Sorry, can you just clarify your question? Um, we have a reconciliation action plan and part of that plan looks at issues to do with procurement, purchasing. Um, so it's very involved with local um, local business, um, of which there are a number of local um, businesses that are Aboriginal owned, operated or staffed. And I'm just wondering whether there's an opportunity for this business advisory group to be more than mindful but interdependent, um, collaborative and in discussion with the reconciliation action plan so that we can have um, some of that discussion occur through the business advisory group in regards to some of our RAP objectives. Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, now that you have brought that to my attention, I can have a look into it and, and see if that's possible. Um, through you, Mayor Cole, um, from the perspective of um, someone who's probably had the longest association with the bag uh, than either um, the manager or the acting director. I don't believe it's so much a interdependence as perhaps um, some overlap and sharing of information and ideas. And I think the point you raise is entirely valid and appropriate. And um, our expectation is that as we move to our next um, wrap, that we will actually start to embed some of the findings and the learnings from that process more into our other strategies and guiding policies. And I would, I would expect that in that light, it's entirely appropriate that when the Business Advisory Group forms up the scope for the review of the economic development strategy and the preparation of a new strategy, that one of the elements that the group might wish to highlight um, for that body of work is um, to explore opportunities for the ED strategy and through the city's involvement in economic development and business attraction and retention um, to also ensure that um, <coughs> some attention is given to um, businesses um, like Kudich and Noongar Rodeo and others that are within the city of Vincent um, to give special attention to those businesses to try and um, give them additional support. Thank you, CEO. Um, are there any further comments in relation to this item? I'll put it. All those in favour? Or you want to wish to close debate? I was just going to note that there is uh, the extraordinary benefit of the chair of the business advisory group also sitting on the reconciliation pl action plan. Absolutely. Uh, working group. That's fantastic. That's joined up thinking right there. Um, I'll put it. All those in favour? I declare it carried. Okay. We have finished the development services items for the night. Thank you very much, Acting Director and manager of policy in place. Where to next, CEO? 10.1. <coughs> Time for engineering. Okay, so the first item is 10.1, City of Vincent Greening Plan Review. Moved. Councillor Loden, seconded Councillor Gondoshevsky. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I'm not going to wax lyrical about the Greening Plan, aside from saying that I think it's a fantastic step forward uh, for the city, um, but I will get on to putting forward an amendment, um, which is not the one on the green. Um, Can I just first of all say if the second, if we go to the seconder to just move the motion before we move the amendment? Do you, so do you wish to comment at this point? On the substantive? On the substantive. The amendment? No, I'll reserve my right to okay. comment on. Go back to you then, Councillor Loden. So I do have um, an amendment to put forward and Tim, do you have it? Mm. 
So the amendment is to include an additional action under Objective 4 of the greening of private land to review the built form policy canopy requirements to determine if the current canopy requirements are sufficient to achieve the identified target of 12 per cent in the private domain. Is there a seconder for this item? Councillor Gondoshevsky, Councillor Lowden. Thank you. Um, my apologies for the, uh, the furphy of the green um, amendment there. Um, it was probably a bit half thought at the time and didn't provide very good uh, guidance to administration on what I was looking for. Um, effectively what I'm looking for here is that we look at the built form policy to determine if we can achieve the target that we're setting. Currently the primary mechanism that we're going to go from our 7% of tree canopy in the private domain to 12% between now and 2050 is the canopy targets and um, from the questions that are submitted through via email to um, the Director of Engineering, there is not confidence around this, around if what we've currently got in the built form policy will achieve that. So I think we should do the work to figure out what that is. That is not an insignificant amount of work, but it is possible to do that, to actually look at what we expect to see in terms of changes in development between now and 2050, what then the resulting tree canopy would be, and whether or not that's going to get us to 12% or not. Okay. I'm always supportive of gathering data on which to base our decisions, so I'm all in. Councillors? Um, Councillor Toppelberg, you wish to speak? Uh, just that I suppose I'll ask a question. Uh, are we sat I guess my only question <coughs> in relation to this is it also relies on the veracity of the 12 per cent being correct as the correct target as well and whether or not, and I guess that's uh, whether we're assessing the built form policy in terms of achieving the target of 12 per cent is correct, uh, but also we should be potentially concurrently uh, assessing whether 12 per cent is the appropriate target uh, within, uh, but yeah, I, I'm, I understand that that's not, not as easy to do and let's get to 12 per cent and worry about it, but I, um, I also am not so sure that the science behind the 12 per cent was necessarily uh, right for the size that we are and the density targets that we have or otherwise, and we may, we may need to increase that as well. But yeah, I'm happy to support the amendment and its intent. Councillors on the amendment. Um, look, I do support the intent of the amendment and I will support it. I just um, hope that in terms of our dealings with the uh, WA Planning Commission and where we're at with some of the issues that Urbanista are trying to highlight, which I don't think um, affect our ability to seriously entertain our uh, canopy um, coverage requirements, um, but just flagging that we are also still dealing with the WAPC around um, what state of play our, design, our, our built form policy will have if and when Design WA does come in. And we are arguing that if Design WA does come in, that it should be a minimum requirement and that we should be allowed to uh, strive higher and do better here in the City of Vincent. So just that is worth uh, a mention, given that that was mentioned from the public gallery today. But in terms of the amendment, I'm happy to support it. Councillors? Okay, I'll put the amendment. All those in favour? Back to the substantive. Any further comment? Thank you, um, Chair. Um, um, my first comment is um, congratulations on the policy um, to the staff through the director. Um, and I think the um, amendment um, definitely enhances that. Just um, one of the most people will get this feedback as well. It's trees, trees, trees. Um, and um, we live in a neighbourhood where people know when a tree has been damaged and they will ring. Um, that includes councillors and our officers know. They already know over the years what tree you're talking to, what park it's happened in, that there's been a storm overnight. Um, it's a big focus of our, of our community and in my, um, since I have lived here, I've seen a massive change um, in the greening of this city. It's, it's certainly noticeable. Um, and it is a topic of conversation that people talk to me about on a regular basis. Um, I just want to um, draw attention to Objective 2, which is about enhancing habitat and promoting biodiversity. One of the <coughs> things that um, our officers do off their own bat is um, they, um, over the years, have been putting nesting boxes and trees all around the community. Um, I didn't know what they were when I first saw them, and I rang and said, does 
something, you know, something weird up in one of the trees. Our officers, our officers have done that because they've understood the biodiversity of the area and that they've tried to enhance that. Um, and that has also meant that they've looked at what plantings are happening. So, for example, we have a massive population of black cockatoos that come over our area on a regular basis. They're endangered and they're um, a very um, sacred, um, sacred bird. And we are promoting um, the um, numbers of that through the planting. So I guess just in regards to objective two, again, um, just for the record, Director, in regards to the Reconciliation Action Plan, um, which threads through much, um, in my view, much of the work that uh, we will do um, in the future. In regards to this, I know the officers are very aware of the biodiversity in regards to the, the native the native flora, but one step further in the RAP plan um, is to look at what is genuinely native to our area, and that means planting in um, a complement to the water tables and to the other plantings um, and the flora and fauna that's already existing. So um, I know the officers are already quite committed to that and hopefully through this greening plan and the understanding of the RAP plan and what we're trying to achieve through that as well. Um, hopefully there'll be some... Um, some increased awareness in that area. Thank you, Councillor Harley. Any further comments on the greening plan, Councillor Loden? Oh, you're close. Well, I just would like to just highlight a few things before Councillor Gonshevsky, you wish to speak first? You reserved your right so you can speak to the... Yes, go ahead. Thank you, Mayor. No, look, I just wanted to echo Councillor Harley's commentary in relation to the observation on the ground in the city in relation to um, the gains that have been made in recent years around greening. And also, if you've ever seen, an, and I'm sure that councillors have, the aerial photos of the city, it's really clear to see how the impactful our greening efforts have been. Um, and yes, obviously it does relate to tree canopy, but it's also, we can also sit on the ground in our town centres with plantings there, um, eco-zoning at the periphery of our parks and reserves, um, which obviously assists both in water consumption as well as um, improving biodiversity. And if you look at um, the regeneration of Walters Brook and down at Banks Reserve. Um, it's magnificent. And I think this draft granting plan is building on those gains and it's also taking up the challenge for how we can encourage tree retention on private land and greening new developments, uh, perhaps more so now that we've added to objective uh, four with the Council Leiden's amendment. Um, I was only just really going to say similar things, but I think that just to emphasise that this has now got... Um, you know, clear targets for private land as well as public land. I think that's a really important step forward in the greening plan, and that's a huge, a huge thing um, to highlight that we do have a, a, a private canopy target. And I think that we've really felt that we've been able to do that because we have our built form policy in place, and because we now require canopy. So it shows you the benefits of actually making changes in your planning framework. So when you come to a greening plan, you can actually say, well, now we're going to put targets into the pub into the private domain. So I think that's a very powerful thing. Um, also good to see that um, we're highlighting the need to advocate the state to the state government on the need for greater protection of trees on privately owned land and also to see the incorporation of our um, street uh, tree selection tool which is um, something that we're pretty excited to see come into effect. Any further comments? Councillor Loden, your closing debate. Anyone before Councillor Loden closes debate? Now I move to you Councillor Loden. Uh, just a final comment about the private domain target there of 12%. That is a significant increase. We're going from 7% to 12%. Um, and my sense, without knowing it, is that we will struggle to get to that 12% based on our current built form policy and that we would need to consider increasing those percentages if we want to achieve that 12%. If that's not what we... If we can't justify that in the built form policy, then we'll need to look to the public domain potentially to achieve those gains to meet our overall target for the city. So I feel that, that there's going to be an interesting process we go through over the next five years with this, and when we look at this again in five years' time, we'll have an even stronger clarity around our ability to meet those targets as well, which would be great. Thanks. Thank you. I'll put the motion. All those in favour? I declare it carried unanimously. Um, on to the next engineering item, 10.2, 2018 Greening Vincent Garden Awards. 
Um, can I have a mover and seconder for this item, please? Move, Councillor Toppleberg, seconded, Councillor Harley. Um, before we commence debate, just to flag that um, we do need to select three council members <coughs> to participate as judges. Um, we did have express expressions of interest from Councillor Gondoszewski, Councillor Castle and Councillor Hallett at the briefing, um, but if there are other council members who wish to nominate, please let me know. Councillor Harley, you're moving the item? Oh, sorry, Councillor Toppleberg. Thank you. Just a question through you to the director. Um, uh, so there was a question asked at the briefing, and there was some uh, discussion. I agree about in relation to looking at uh, um, prizes equal to the value of, but non-monetary uh, prizes or things that you know, perhaps required expenditure within the city or supporting local business or otherwise. I agree wholeheartedly that that's best off for a 2019 project, but I do have a recollection that it. <coughs> A couple of times in previous years, the same discussion has been had. So my question to you is whether you think that we should amend the item to include that as a request of administration as number three, or the fact that I've now asked this question out in public that it'll be considered for 2019 in any event. Through you, Michael. Um If you see the notes that we give after briefing, it's definitely our preference to do it for 2019. And if that's the will of um, the council, and that's what we'll do, we'll, we'll look at options for 2019. I guess my question is, does it require a decision of council, or is it, can it be taken as a request uh, for administration to consider uh, by, by, by virtue of the discussion that's happened thus far? Um, I think it doesn't need to amend the decision. I think it's a request from council and the administration can deal with it. Is there an amendment on the table, or are you happy to accept that, Councillor Toppleberg? I'm happy to refer back to the time and date at the uh, recording at a future time. The audio recording. Uh, sorry, audio visual. <coughs> but the face is captured on camera saying that, Director. Um, any further comments, um, Councillor Harley? Uh, no, I just noted the change of venue, which I think is a really good step. It's a massive event. Um, I think one of our most popular, it's always. It's always, uh, you know, cosy um, when we're in the um, function room next door, and perhaps this gives um, an opportunity, you know, for the gardening for the gardening crew to maybe have a display or something there. But I think this one's going to be our best event ever, and I'm happy to be a backup if any of the judges fall ill or choose to do something else. <laughs> Not that I'm wishing it, but I, I'm happy to be an alternate. <laughs> So currently we have before us Councillor Castle, Councillor Hallett and Councillor Gondoszewski as judges with Councillor Harley offering to be available if there's sickness or any other issues. <laughs> um, is there any further debate or do you wish me, for me to put the motion with the three council list, councillors as listed? There being no hands in the air, I'll put it. All those in favour? I declare the motion carried. Eleven point six. Yeah. So we're moving on to eleven point six, delegated authority review two thousand and eighteen. This is an absolute majority decision. Can I please have a mover and second? A move, Councillor Toppleberg, seconded, Councillor Gondoszewski. Although um, we're not there yet. Do you wish to speak to the item? <laughs> How presumptuous of me, Councillor Gondoszewski. Councillors, any debate on this item? I'll put it. All those in favour? I declare it carried. Moving on to um, one of the key items on tonight's agenda, 11.7, .7, adoption of the 2018-2019 annual budget, an absolute majority decision required. Can I have a mover and seconder, please? Moved Councillor Toppleberg, seconded Councillor Loden. Um, thank you. Um, I'll leave it to the Mayor to make the general comments about the budget. I just want to make a brief comment about some of the chatter that's gone on uh, in recent months politically and in, uh, uh, and in the media in relation to, um, uh, in particular, into uh, inflation or CPI and uh, rates. And I just, for me, uh, all I say is that I look at the basket of goods that is considered in the, the calculation and look at the expenses that local government incurs and just cannot reconcile the relationship between the two. The, uh, if you look at the services that our community not just demands but expects of us and that's largely because we have provided an excellent level of service uh, across everything that we do and we uh, 
you know, you colloquially talk about punching above our weight, but we absolutely do uh, try and take everything on board and, and, and uh, do as much as we can. Uh, we often talk in this chamber about picking up the slack where uh, other agencies um, or other levels of government perhaps should uh, be more active and that we take that responsibility at local government. And a lot of that does, uh, does mean that some, some of those costs uh, are borne by the community. And I think that, uh, as I said, the, what we deliver for what we uh, take from uh, people's pockets I think is extraordinary and we should be proud of that as a community, that we're able to collectively, uh, you know, uh, still as one of the lowest rating uh, metropolitan local governments, that we're able to deliver the services that we are and with all 11 square kilometres and 35 odd thousand people that we are, that we're able to achieve what we achieve and that we uh, are leaders in the field in uh, certain things. Um, yeah, that's, uh, we're not without areas for improvement, absolutely, but I just wanted to make a general comment about the budget and uh, the attempt to politically to try and tie uh, or the, the intimation that any ra a rise in rates above CPI is somehow er erroneous from a, a council perspective. That's just an absolute nonsense because the basket of goods that calculates that figure has nothing to do with our business as local government. Thank you, Councillor Toppelberg. Councillor Loden. Thank you, Chair. Um, and apologies for this. Um, I've put through an email through Director Corporate Services. Um, she's indicated to me that she provided a response, but I haven't been able to find the response. My question was just around um, the entry fee for Beattie Park being a dollar and whether the, we considered it, what would be the impact. Is it possible to amend that to be a uh, free entry? Through you, Mayor, uh, we did discuss this at the budget workshop last week, and my notes indicated that following significant discussion, um, there was no move from one dollar, so downwards to zero. Um, I apologise that you haven't received my email. I did send it. Uh, it, it must be out of the way. Um, there would be minimal um, financial implications if there was a decision to reduce the um, entrance fee for spectators from one dollar to zero. Councillor Loden. Uh, could I move an amendment? So it's page um, 773 of the agenda, um, attachment 5, uh, to amend the spectator fee for 16 years and over from $1 down to $0. Through you, Mayor Cole, just to clarify for all council members, that would re uh, appear in the form of a change to recommendation 5, so the word subject to and then Councillor Loden's suggested change would appear at the end of Recommendation 5. So 773 and also page 36 in print at the bottom of the page. Can I have a seconder for the amendment, please? Seconded, Councillor Hallett. Councillor Loden. Thank you. Um, my reasons for putting this amendment forward was because I thought that it had been agreed at the workshop, or in principle. Um, and uh, putting a zero entry fee will reduce friction at the front counter. We, as the director pointed out, collect neg negligible fees for this. And if that does result in an increase of patronage, for people viewing kids swimming, sitting in the cafe will likely recoup that funds anyway. Councillor Hallett, do you wish to speak to it? Any councillors wish to comment? I'll put the amendment. All those in favour? Declare it carried unanimously. We're back to the substantive. Any comments? Okay, well, I will wax lyrical. Um, so I just want to really state that this budget has really taken what was learnt through the Imagine Vincent process and um, not only have we done the community budget submissions but we've actually taken what we've identified as the priorities from Imagine Vincent which will be the priorities in our draft strategic community plan which we are expecting to have at the council meeting next month 
for um, approval to advertise. And um, we basically took all of that feedback through Imagine Vincent. We came up with six key themes around enhanced environment, accessible city, connected community, thriving places and sensitive design, and innovative and accountable. Um, and basically used those as the sort of the backbone of the budget and to, in, to basically inform where council um, is spending the money. Um, in terms of some of the fantastic initiatives that we have on um, the budget, when you're looking at things like enhanced environment, we've got significant contribution towards solar PV um, cells that are going to go on administration buildings, including here, Beatty Park, um, the depot, that was the third one, yes, the depot. And we've also got some great water and energy saving initiatives. Um, Accessible City will be delivering with the state government another pedestrian crossing on Vincent Street adjacent to Beatty Park. We'll be delivering an integrated transport plan and Loftus Street bike lanes. And these are just some things, they're not everything, by the way. Um, Connected community, we're looking at uh, $300,000 to continue our fantastic festivals and events programs. We've got community funding to the tune of $120,000. We've got lots of money going to, towards youth and reconciliation. Some of the youth stuff is quite fantastic, including a skate park mini master plan. And also we're going to be replacing the half pipe at the um, Leaderville skate park. Uh, thriving places. This is a this is a critical one where we do, as we mentioned, have our North Perth Common project, which is our, our our key project in terms of open space delivery for the next coming financial year. But we're also um, putting four hundred and fifty thousand dollars towards Banks Reserve, and um, we have two hundred ninety thousand dollars to develop additional public open space. And the location is to be determined, subject to the conclusion of our public open space strategy that we're currently working through. Um, in sensitive design, we're looking at um, a number of things there, including electronic um, lodgement of applications to make that all work better, and innovation, innovative and accountable. This, there's a number of things here, but one I would like to highlight is that we are spending um, significantly on renewal and maintenance. We still have got a maintenance backlog, and if you consider that Beatty Park alone is receiving $700,000 in terms of maintenance going towards that. Um, so I think that when Councillor Tobelberg talked about what is a fair and reasonable rate to set, I would say that we're still dealing with um, some issues from the past in terms of the backlog of maintenance, but at the same time we're planning for the future and we're putting a lot of money towards, for example, public open space because we are a growing community, we're densifying, we have more high-rise developments coming through, so we do need to make sure we don't stop still and that we do continue to deliver for now and for the future. Um, Obviously, we have Julian here, and he's probably really keen to know what the rates, what the rate increases are. So, um, for um, resident, for residential, it's a 2.95% increase. Commercial, 2%. Um, there has been recognition that a lot of our local businesses are doing it tough, and that they are experiencing um, the economic pressures, so that was um, wanting to keep that commercial rate low and uh, we think that we've really sort of come to a, a rate rise increase that really is, is reasonable and fair, um, constrained and still ensures that we maintain one of the um, uh, best um, res uh, sorry, best rates in terms of other metropolitan councils. So. Um, Bearing that in mind, there is a huge list of things under the budget, and it's not, um, a, you know, don't want to bore you by going through each and every one of them, but I do think that there's some fantastic things coming out of our community um, consultation through Imagine Vincent that really delivers on what community members were asking from us, and it's um, quite a few exciting projects on the go here. Any further comments on the budget? Okay, I'll put it. Oh, actually, sorry, before I do that, I just want to say a huge thank you to our Director of Corporate Services, Karen Batten. She joined us in February new, and she has delivered this budget to Council within the 2017-18 um, <coughs> financial year with Venetia at her side. And I um, would just like to say thank you for what's been a really orderly and fantastic process from Council's perspective. You've done a smashing job. I'm really happy. Thank you. Um, any further comments? I'll put it. All those in favour? Declare the budget adopted. Thank you.
13.2 adopt an uh, appointment of an alternate member for Mindari Regional Council, 5th of July 2018. Absolute majority decision required. Can I have a mover and seconder for this item? Move Councillor Gondraszewski, seconded Councillor Toppelberg. I would like to nominate. I would like to second that. <laughs> so much excitement. <laughs> So much excitement in the room. Does anyone else wish to nominate or speak to the motion? All right, well, I will, um, we will insert uh, Councillor Gonczeszewski's name into the recommendation and we will vote on that. All those in favour, declare it carried with much excitement. The next item is 13.3 Corporate Business Plan 2018-19 to 2021-22, another absolute majority decision required. Can I have a mover and seconder, please? Moved Councillor Gontoszewski, seconded Councillor Loden. Um, this probably isn't going to get the same fanfare as budget and community budget submissions, and, and part of that's because we're getting better at this and they're all coming to the same meeting. So again, I just want to, I'm absolutely supportive. I'm very um, thank you, thankful for all of the work that's gone into this, um, setting out our uh, plans for the next four years. Um, there's a lot of uh, fantastic projects in there under our um, strategic priorities um, and a number of which have been um, put forward by the community through budget submissions and um, have been thoroughly analysed, debated and discussed, well not debated, discussed and considered um, in, in the formation of this plan. So supportive of this one. Thank you, Councillor Gondraszewski. Councillor Loden. I don't want to add too much. Um, just one point, um, really looking forward to the sustainable environment strategy being delivered. Uh, during this financial year. I believe we've been working on it now for three and a half years, so it um, be good to see that one unfold and the various initiatives that will then flow into next CBP from that plan as well. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Loden. Any further comments on the corporate business plan? I'd just like to say that we do like to keep busy at the City of Vincent. We uh, have a lot of projects on the go and this is going to be another bumper year ahead with um, lots of exciting projects to deliver. And just to compliment Darren from communications on the beautiful um, layout. Thank you. Just while we're commenting on layout, I think it's great that the uh, former leadable taxi rank will survive for four years on the front page of the corporate business plan. That's simply traffic moving through the city of Vincent, which is a vibrant and happening destination. <laughs> Through you, Mayor Cole, I might just add that the second part of the recommendation does reference editorial design and formatting changes yet to be determined by me. So I may well take that into consideration. Thank you. Um, any further comments? OK, I'll put the motion. All those in favour? I declare the corporate business plan carried. Yes. We have only one more item on this evening's agenda. It is a confidential item. So I will just have to have a mover and seconder to go behind closed doors. Thank you for tuning in at home. We bid you good night. Um, can I have a mover, please? Councillor Harley, seconded Councillor Hallett. All those in favour, declare it carried.